There is certainly a lot to keep track of as fighting escalates in Israel and Palestine. The Gaza Strip is now under siege as Israel drops bombs in retaliation for Hamas's brutal attacks, which killed 1,400 people earlier this month, most of them civilians. Since then, Israeli officials say that their counterattacks have killed several top Hamas leaders, but Palestinian civilians have been caught in the crossfire as well. The Palestinian Ministry of Health says that more than 2,800 Palestinians have been killed, also mostly civilians. Plus, more than 10,000 have been hurt, and the Israeli government has cut off access to food, water, and energy for everyone else in Gaza. And, of course, all of this is informed by many decades of war and tension that led up to all of this. And, understandably, many people in the U.S. are struggling to understand the context behind this conflict. Well, joining me now to help break it all down as best he can is Isidine Fischer, a senior lecturer at Dartmouth College who worked as a political advisor to the U.N. Special Envoy to the Middle East during the early 2000s. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So certainly this is an enormous topic to, to tackle in the limited time that we have here. But I, I would like to ask, you know, what do you see in your educated opinion and also in the work that you've done has led up the precipitating moments to this particular brutal attack and then, of course, the subsequent actions? Um, obviously, this is, as you said, it's a long and old conflict. It's been going on for more than a century and the number of victims, the incidents of brutal kind of attacks um, are so many in this conflict. So, of course, it is very important that we understand the context and we understand where this violence is coming from in order also to be able to understand where this could lead to. But having said this, and before we go into the context, I just want to make sure so that no viewer is confused explaining the context has nothing to do with justifying brutality. That's right. Those are completely different things. And we can we can do both. We can be indignant mm -hmm. by the brutality and certainly condemn it. But also if we want to step back and try to understand where this is going, we need to understand where this is coming from. And I hope this is what we're doing here. Absolutely, for sure, because our hearts go out to anyone who has lost anyone in the Gaza Strip tonight as we learn more about this conflict. As we sit here in the U.S. Uh, watching these images, perhaps touched by family members or people we know in our communities. So if you want to put it in a kind of a, a very rather sim simplistic but also kind of succinct way, what you have in Israel-Palestine, what we had over the last century, is a conflict over a land between two peoples. Each of them has a historic claim to that land. One side lived there for centuries and see it as its homeland, and the other side sees it as its historical and ancestors' homeland and want to come back to it. So you have this clash between Palestinian nationalism on one hand and Zionism on the other hand. It's a, as I said, it's a protracted conflict. It took many shapes, many rounds of, of, of violence. But ultimately, what settled down um, in the international community is that both sides need to share the land. Um, regardless of the validity of the claims, regardless of whether you can prove in a court of law that you have a deed to this land, whether uh, through the Bible or through other uh, means, ultimately, we have two peoples today who live in this land and who need to share it. However, the attempts to get the two people to share the land so far have failed. We have, you know, Madrid Conference, 91. We have Oslo, 93. We have Camp David, 2000, and so on and so forth. There are, you know, numerous attempts to bring and maps drawn and so on. None of it so far had managed to get enough agreement on both sides, enough majorities on the Palestinian and the Israeli side so that we can go to a peaceful resolution. So what has been happen happening over the last 10 years is that the conflict is a bit frozen. Um, as Secretary Blinken said in his uh, congressional hearing upon his nomination, is that you know there is no hope in the foreseeable future to reach a peaceful settlement. So the United States have been trying to just keep things as they are and prevent further deterioration. And fortunately, one of the characteristics of this conflict is that it is unstable. 
you can't keep it, you can't keep the status quo for a long time because on both sides, you have parties who are keen on changing the status quo and push it to further advance their claims. And what we've seen in Gaza, the attacks from Hamas, those brutal attacks, are their way to advance their claims to all of Palestine. What ends up being the larger global concern as well as we see other countries outside of Gaza sort of drawing allegiances to both sides? Well, if you, again, if you take a step back and think about this conflict, the scale, uh, sorry, about this attack, about the Hamas attack, the scale of the attack, the particular shocking brutality of the attack, the nature of the targets, the fact that most of the victims are civilians, people in their homes and so on. This attack is almost, unless it's a, it's a completely rogue operation, which is practically impossible, it's a deliberate attempt. It's almost designed to produce an effect. And the effect is what you're seeing today in Gaza, is that Israel reprised it. Israel had a doctrine since its establishment not to let any um, attack on its territory or citizens go unpunished, quote-unquote. And that means not just retaliate um, proportionately, but even, you know, adopt a harsher um, response so that you deter further attacks. The tragedy of this doctrine is that the other side is not deterred, as you can see. So it, it seems as if Hamas has produced this attack in order to elicit Israel's response, which in turn, as you can see in, you know, around the region, is mobilizing Arabs and Muslims worldwide, including in the United States, around the Palestinian cause to defend the Palestinian people and the victims that are falling in Gaza and so on and so forth. So instead of this being a Hamas government of Israel, Netanyahu coalition kind of conflict, it becomes Israelis and even Jews on one side and Palestinians and even Arabs and Muslims on the other side. It's this hardening of identities that this, um, this attack is designed to produce. And sadly, this is exactly the impact that is happening right now. What's the danger in other countries now coming into this conflict? As we've seen and we've talked about, you know, this tension has existed for decades, right? But now it seems like there is, a, a, I guess, for lack of a better term, a larger possibility that other nations are going to be more drawn to be more active in this conflict. Yes. First of all, you know, we have to remember that Hamas is part of a broader Iranian coalition in the region that includes Hamas in the Palestinian territories, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and others elsewhere, but mainly Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas. And we are what we're seeing today is that Hamas is obviously um, the main party, but Hezbollah is also exchanging fire with Israel on the northern border. And Iran is producing noises about possible intervention if things get out of control, and so on and so forth. So there is definitely a risk of a broader regional uh, confrontation. And even if we don't get, hopefully we, do, we don't get into an active conflict that involves all those together, because that would be um, more catastrophic. But even even we don't get there, you already raise the temperature in the region, make it harder for countries like Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, who, <clears throat> who are trying to find some peaceful kind of modus vivendi with Israel, um, or peace agreements or something in that direction, kind of reduce their ability to do this and mobilize the populations, including their own populations, behind the call for steadfastness, fastness, and war, and so on. As we look at these images, I mean, it's hard not to understand that civilians are the ones that are li quite literally being caught in the crossfire. They are at the center of these two clashes and uh i think it's important to always remember that it's it's innocent folks who are trying to live their lives that end up in the middle of this it has been the case all the time if you mm. look at the at the conflict you look at the victims the great majority of the victims of this conflict historically have been civilians women and children um, um amongst them you know most of all and in a way um civilians unfortunately and tragically um, are, are the one constituency that the, that the warring parties are less interested in. 
Hamas deliberately hides among civilians because this is what terrorist organizations, this is what guerrilla um, and militia do. Um, and they, they, they elicit that response. They know that response is going to hit civilians more. And in a way, it serves their purpose. Israel also, while it says that the army says that it, you know, its rules of engagement respect civilian life and try to avoid it, but you cannot bomb an area that is 142 square miles that has 2 million people. You can't bomb it or, <clears throat> or send your army in without, um, a huge number of uh, your victims being civilians. And again, sadly, the civilians also on the Israeli side are the ones paying the price for this. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, I wonder if you could just sort of tell us in your, given your experience and your education about this region, what's the best possible outcome here? Well, the best possible outcome is actually not going to come from the region. You can read in, you know, today's newspapers calls on Israel to, you know, um, to hold the attack or at least reconsider because the idea of an all out attack once for all, as Tom Friedman said, in New York Times today is wrong for Israel and its security. We have seen this happening before and that never actually produced the uh, expected um, effect. So, but the region, it's very hard to see that the, a positive response is going to come from the region. And I think based on my experience and based on history, the, our best hope lies in, uh, tragically enough, lies in Washington. Mm. It's the United States that can actually play the most constructive role here. Israel cannot pull this off on its own. It needs help from not only the US, but it needs help from the neighbors, from region, from the regional countries. But the neighbors and Israel cannot alone find a way to put all those new moving pieces together. Only the US can do that. Mm -hmm. Historically, that has been the American leader, what American leadership was about. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, not only this administration, but previous administrations have led, have been led by this delusion that you can disengage from the Middle East, that you can put the Middle East on a back burner because you're busy with China. And when we do this, you, you, the only result is you caught unprepared because again, the Middle East is unstable, the status quo is unstable. Mm -hmm. So you can't put it on a back burner and expect it to stay there. It's gonna collapse and then you have to leave everything that's in your hand and go and tend to it. Think, where is President Biden going this week? Right. We don't have a speaker in Congress. Where is the president going? Not to the Congress. He's going to Israel. Right. Why? Because you can't afford to leave it. So the lesson is, I think the best outcome is for the U.S. to understand that it has to lead change in the Middle East if it wants to protect its interest, if it wants to protect its global leadership role. It cannot dissociate itself from the Middle East and it cannot satisfy with just keeping the status quo. Yeah. It's on and All right. Professor, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.